Buffalo Trace is, uh, has one of the largest production plants in the industry. Uh, it produces some of the highest rated bourbons in the world. It is internationally known. Uh, and when you look at the base, there are about 310 employees who work here year round. What most people don't realize are the number of distilleries that were around prior to Prohibition. And many people don't realize that Prohibition was actually designed to do away with alcohol. Before Prohibition, over 2,000 distilleries were making product in Kentucky. By the time Prohibition was done in 1933, doctors had, uh, uh, had stepped in and they were the saving grace for whiskey. To get your whiskey during Prohibition, you had to have a doctor's prescription. However, if you look at this chart, you get an idea of the number of distilleries that were closed. A lot of them were mom and pop distilleries, very small in nature, very small batch bourbons and whiskeys. Over 2,000, by the time Prohibition is done, only 30 survive what the government put them through. Today, there are only 10. So 10 major distilleries in Kentucky produce 95% of all the bourbon in the world. Even though bourbon does not have to be made in Kentucky, 95% of it still comes from distilleries in Kentucky. To get your whiskey during Prohibition required a doctor's prescription. One of those would get you one of these every 10 days. You were allowed three pint bottles a month with your doctor's prescription. An epidemic broke out. Every member of the family got sick. Even the babies needed it for their gums while they were teething. By the time Prohibition was done in 1933, doctors had written over six million prescriptions just for whiskey. And in states that allow it, the 21st Amendment allowed states to control the distribution of whiskey. So in states like Kentucky, it became privately owned and that's how drug stores are able to sell whiskey and alcoholic beverages today. In other states, they are state controlled and the state basically retains all the revenues associated with the product. This gives you an idea of the type of um, political atmosphere that existed back during the time of prohibition. So as you can see here on this bottle of whiskey, in order for it to be sold uh, it had to be distributed through a drugstore, the apothecary, and it had to carry the label that it was for medicinal purposes only. It was during this period of time that uh, Al Capone and Elliot Nest exploded in the market. Because of this restriction and the elimination of so many stills around the country, um, the underworld started to make their own product and that became an entirely different nightmare for the government because instead of eliminating whiskey, it created a black market for whiskeys, alcoholic beverages, spirits, gins, uh, vodkas, all without the control of the government. And so a lot of money that would normally have been go going into the revenues or the coffers for the states and the federal government went directly into the hands of the underworld. When did that stop, or has it? Uh, <laughs> uh, legally, uh, uh, prohibition ended in 1933, and supposedly the formal product came back into existence. However, moonshiners are still in existence today, as we all know, and uh, some of them brag about the fact that they are still able to make their hooch the way they made it back in the good old days. Let's take a look over here. A lot of people don't realize the impact of the settlers on Kentucky. The original settlers coming in were fleeing the Whiskey Rebellion that was going on up in Pennsylvania. They were of Scottish, Irish, and Welsh descent. Notice the features. You can see the different features associated with the Scottish and the Irish and the Welsh. Notice the dog. Greyhound dogs and whippets were Welsh dogs. What most people don't realize, the first animals to race in Kentucky were not horses, they were dogs. Look at the African Americans. Notice their features. 
because they came over as part of slavery. Different parts of different countries, and they came into this area. What is so special, all during the revolution, all during the Civil War, all during the skirmishes with the government, there were two places that never got attacked. One was hospitals, because they took care of the injured from both sides. The other, distilleries, because they sold whiskey to both sides. Now, take a look at these folks again and notice. Look at their eyes. Those are not the kind of people that you want to upset. But they made whiskey, and they made a darn good product. And for Kentucky, it was one of the main revenue sources for the state of Kentucky. Because 20% of what you're paying for is nothing but tax. So 20% of a bottle of eight-year-old bourbon is nothing but tax. And that tax goes out at the state, county, and federal level. It also goes for school taxes uh, and for local um, operating taxes for the local governments. So you pay tax on a barrel of whiskey just like you, it's called an ad valorem tax. You pay that tax every year on every barrel of whiskey that you're storing in your warehouse. And for this distillery, at any one time, we are warehousing somewhere between a quarter of a million and 310,000 barrels of whiskey. I like to talk about this young man here. This is my father. I'm actually a third direct generation to be here. Uh, my grandfather was here for 52 years. Dad was here for 47 years. Uh, he was away from here for five years while it was in, uh, in the service in World War II. Uh, but in this picture, he is um, leak hunting. So one of the jobs at the distillery is to try to locate leaky barrels and repair them in place. The amazing part of him is he was the only living person to have personally handled every millionth barrel to have come through this distillery. Uh, and at 92 years old, he rolled out the six millionth barrel at Buffalo Trace Distillery. When was that? That was in May of 2008. Uh, he just recently passed away in January of this year. He lacked two weeks of being 95 years old. Had at least one shot of bourbon a day. At least one shot of bourbon a day. My grandfather's in the business also. My grandfather and Colonel Blanton were personal friends. Uh, Colonel Blanton started here when he was 16 years old, and he and my, my grandfather had become friends away from the distillery. And when Colonel Blanton started to take over this distillery, he invited my grandfather to come work here. And he was one of the first African Americans to ever be uh, uh, taken to New York on a business trip to make decisions about whiskey and barrels of whiskey at this distillery. If I could, I would have loved to be able to do that. Believe it or not, uh, this distillery was, was somewhat unique. Um, not only um, like my, uh, my father as a, a, a warehouse supervisor, um, my grandfather uh, as a uh, operations supervisor, unheard of back in the day. But uh, the distillery uh, set a precedent. There were, um, uh, it was a place of equality. So what we found interesting was, even though they had uh, restrooms for uh, the African Americans and other restrooms for the uh, whites, the, the word was in the warehouse, if you've got to go, you've got to go, and you go to the nearest warehouse, and everybody got along. Uh, they had a unique arrangement. They basically were their own little family. So they took care of one another. They were on farms and had property adjacent to each other. They helped each other out when they were in need. Um, just an interesting uh, arrangement that continued on today. So for the city of Frankfurt, the, uh, the distilleries around Frankfurt um, uh, had an, uh, a pretty much fair balance of, of whites and African Americans. Um, and it was a very supportive community. So you very seldom ever even heard of a riff at a distillery. It was just not tolerated. Uh, everybody had their work to do, and everybody did their job.
when paddle boats came into existence, the, uh, the volume of uh, whiskey being produced went out the roof. So with the expansion of Buffalo Trace, uh, this distillery became one of the largest production plants in the industry. And not only did the, sh did the whiskey go down the Kentucky, Ohio, and Mississippi River, with paddle boats they were able to go up stream in all directions and at that point the industry exploded. We are now in the heart of the distillery bourbon making process. This is our column still. It is the primary still for the making of our product. As I said, some people call them beer stills, some people call them column stills, some people call them continuously operating stills. The proper name for the still is a coffee still named after the Irishman who patented it. So you can see the, the corn and the water and the particulates dribbling down. What you don't see are the alcohol vapors going up. They go through a condenser and come down over here first time through, it's like lemonade. It's about 120 proof, but it's got a little bit of a milky color to it. Well, you're standing on top of another big pot still. It goes through it, goes back up, goes through another condenser. Now it comes down over here. It's crystal clear. They call it White Dog, Everclear, Georgia Moon, White Lightning. It got the nickname White Dog because even though it is crystal clear, it will bite you. So for bourbon, it cannot come off of the still any higher than 160 proof. Most people bring their bourbon off the still at a lot less than that. The lower the proof off of your still, the more you can, re you can retain the natural characteristics and flavor of the product or the grains that you made it from. Here's the Buffalo Trace. 